Welcome to Shaping the Future. In this episode, I'm talking to Paul Keel, who is a PhD candidate at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology, about the mysterious cold blob in the northern Atlantic Ocean. This cold blob appears conspicuously on global temperature anomaly charts located south of Greenland. It is currently the focus of a lot of research looking at the mechanisms that contribute to climate change and how these are being impacted by the billions of tonnes of CO2 we add annually to the atmosphere. I have also added links in the description to two recent articles posted by The Carbon Brief and Mashable that look at Paul and his colleagues' research in more detail. The next podcast, I'll be speaking to Dr. Kai Kornhuber at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University to discuss Arctic heating and how what we are witnessing in the Arctic is going to impact us at lower latitudes. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for taking the time today. Can we start just by clarifying? I mean, what I'm calling the cold blob in your paper, you refer to as a warm hole. And can you start by clarifying what this is and why we're talking about pretty much the same thing in seemingly opposite ways? What it is, is that if you look at maps of temperature anomalies compared to a temperature anomalies being the anomaly compared to the pre-industrial temperature and the warming that's been happening due to climate change. You see that almost all of the globe has warmed, but there is a distinct region in the North Atlantic where there's actually been a slight cooling. It's not a recent phenomenon. It's been going on for a couple of decades at least. Yeah, it looks like a blob and it's south of Greenland. And so people have called it the cold blob, but the Scientific literature has stuck to the word warming hole. We also like the term warming hole because we do different experiments with our climate models and in some we see an absolute cooling and in some we only see a lack of warming. So for our purpose, this is very much a good name. Okay. So it's, it's kind of a hole in the overall warming, would you say? that's a t- Exactly, yeah. In your recently published paper, you identified processes that are impacting the cold blob. Can you describe what some of these processes are and how they're interacting with the cold blob and perhaps with each other? Sure, yeah. The main drivers of the cold blob um, are associated with changing ocean circulation. That means a number of different things, which is one of the main points of our paper. And so, for example, it means that the AMOC, which is the overturning circulation, So that involves warm waters being transported from the tropics to the polar oceans and the North Atlantic. And then this water sinks in those regions and then recirculates back at the bottom. And we found that this circulation will in the future very likely slow down. And there are indications that it has already slowed down. And thereby less warm waters will reach the North Atlantic. And this is thought to be an important aspect of this cold blob. Usually this is what people talk about in more popular science. They would refer to this as the Gulf Stream slowing down. However, this is not the only phenomenon. We also show that a circulation system is changing, which is called the subpolar gyre. And this is different to the AMOC because it's purely horizontal. So it only circulates in the horizontal. Is that in the atmosphere or is it just above? Is it Whereabouts is the subpolar gyre? It's in gyre? the ocean. It's an ocean circulation. There's a big tropical gyre and then there's a smaller subpolar gyre, which is much smaller, but it's still very important for the heat transport. Okay. So on its eastern side, it transports... Um, warm waters to the north, and on its western side, it transports cold waters from the north to the south. And we find that this gyre is intensifying in such a way that more cold waters from the north are imported into the North Atlantic. And uh, therefore, this also clearly contributes to the cold blob. And it's also likely that this is happening before the AMOC slowdown. So this happens this precedes the, the Gulf Stream slowing down. Um, and this is also confirmed by other studies. You're talking about the cold water that's being coming yeah. into the circulation. Where is that originating from? Yeah, 
there's another study which looks at this in more detail and they found that this water is mainly originating from the Labrador seas, which is yeah, between Canada and Greenland, and it uh, circulates down from there. And that's kind of the spark which sets it off. Okay. And we haven't looked into those details uh, in our case. So it might be different in our climate model, but there are indications that it's coming from the Labrador Sea. And actually, one of my co-authors is uh, looking into this and preparing to uh, have a second study on these mechanisms. But when you're looking at the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which is this circulation of ocean currents, and are you implying that by the, your research that this whole slowing down process processes is now becoming more I don't know more pronounced or accelerating or is it what's the status on that at the moment um, it's a good question because it's hard to answer the reason is that we don't really have very much detailed observations um, so the AMOC has only really been measured consistently since 2004. And you can infer a, a decreasing trend from that, but there is a huge part of that which is likely to be natural variability. And yeah. so, yeah, we rely mainly on theoretical models, on, on climate model projections, um, also maybe some paleo, some more indirect paleo observations. The evidence is not very clear. Okay, and Arctic warming at the moment, I mean, as we're talking right now, seems to be certainly in the alarming phase with, you know, difference to the rest of the planet. So we would expect maybe a supply of more cold water coming down. Is that a fair assumption? In principle, this is expected to become stronger with global warming. Mm -hmm. And part of this is because the warming in the Arctic is stronger than the global average. And therefore, there is a lot of uh, meltwater from the Greenland glaciers. And this is thought to be related to that. And climate models can show this link. But um, conclusive, I, I'm not sure about conclusive observation evidence in this. What I would also say is that what was interesting in our study is that the behavior of the subpolar gyre circulation wasn't linear. So it didn't just increase all the time. There was a certain breaking point where the increase stopped and it re reverted back to its kind of pre-industrial state. So these ocean circulations, they behave in quite a complex manner and very, yeah, in this case, non-linear. What would be a breaking point for the subpolar gyre to, to revert? Well, breaking point sounds dramatic. Maybe we can just say the peak of its intensity. Yeah, so again, we are looking into this for a second study, and there's a natural boundary to how strong this gyre can get, and then at some point it will weaken again, and the other thing is that the peak of the gyre in our study is associated with the peak of the warming hole too and after that the warming hole actually starts to warm and not cool still less than the global average and so at this point the forcing from the co2 uh, from the global warming might just overwhelm the regional cooling and that then triggers uh, another set of effects for the ocean circulation okay so you're alluding there to co2 which comes back to the, the human contribution, and uh, I assume that's what you mean. Can you talk a little bit about what this paper does in terms of uh, linking human contribution to this cold blob, to the AMOC? How do we feature in all of this? I would say that the human CO2 forcing is driving the ocean circulation changes. Okay. And what the first thing they are affecting are the high latitude ocean circulation changes, and they trigger the warming hole and also probably interact with it. But again, this is quite complex, so we're putting it in a second study. Yeah. Then with stronger forcing or just with more time, because it's the the ocean just naturally is a quite slow system, then also the lower latitude AMOC is affected. We see evidence that the high latitude ocean circulation reacts first, which forms the warming hole or contributes to the warming hole, and then the AMOC also uh, reacts to the global warming. And you say that the AMOC, it's slowing down is over a longer time period. I mean, if you've only been measuring it 16 years, how do you determine the behavior of the AMOC in terms of whether it's slow or how it might respond to enlarged warming hole. I just talked about these um, 
experiments with the climate model where we try and reproduce the historical setting. We also do experiments where we apply stronger uh, CO2 forcing and thereby kind of simulate the future. And in those experiments, there is a clear decrease of the AMOC then falls outside of this uh, realm of natural variability, which we have for the fairly weak forcing that we uh, still have at the moment or in the historical period. For, for stronger CO2 forcing, all of our realizations of the climate model agree on this AMOC decline. Let's say you're in a bar and you're talking to a member of the public and you're trying to explain the significance of all of this as it plays out. What would you say the highest potential risk is of the impact on the AMOC? There is this idea, which I think is also fairly popular, within which the AMOC breaks down completely as a follow-up to global warming as a consequence. And I think most studies now find that this is very unlikely to happen, but not totally unlikely. Uh, instead, I think most studies project that there's just a gradual weakening, as we also see it in our climate model. And the implications from this uh, weakening, well, one of the implications is the formation of the warming hole, right? And then mm -hmm. the warming hole has effects on atmospheric circulation. So the warming hole is likely to produce more high pressure systems over the eastern North Atlantic and the British Isles and Northern Europe, Western Europe. And that again um, has other effects of weather patterns. So it's most likely going to influence our weather and climate over the coming decades. Other than that, I would also say that because we the reduced heat import we see from the south is contrasted by this increased heat export in the ocean to the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And this will further heat up the Arctic disproportionately because it's already heating up more than other places on the Earth. And this kind of also contributes to that. Okay. I would just maybe stress that there's many different climate models and they show different results. But one reason why we have high confidence in our results is that we have this many, not just one simulation, but a lot of simulations. And thereby we account for this natural variability effect. And this is very important because this North Atlantic is a highly variable region. The other thing just to stress is that the AMOC decline is very likely a cause of the warming hole and not a consequence, as well as the changing of the subpolar gyre is probably more complicated. They might be inter uh, intertwined and, and there might be a feedback group. Here, I would also say to first degree, the warming hole is a consequence of the changing ocean, ocean circulation and not the other way around. Okay, it sounds like these mechanisms, you've got the AMOC, you've got the subpolar gyre, how they're working together, almost independently dynamic, that one could recede and the other one could pick up, or, you know, that's kind of why it's quite hard to talk about them. Is there a sense of that? Yeah, well, they are definitely connected through physical mechanisms, the AMOC and the subpolar gyre. But part of why the warming hole is forming and why it's evolving the way it does is that these mechanisms and this relationship between the low latitude heat transport, which is mainly the AMOC, and the high latitude heat transport, which is a subpolar gyre, but also a small overturning contribution, they seem to change under global warming. So we have also a simulation of the pre-industrial state, so where there's no CO2 applied at all. And in, in this simulation, if you have a, a stronger AMOC in the tropics and subtropics, you also tend to have a stronger heat transport per, in the higher latitudes. And this has been shown by other studies also. Mm -hmm. And this relationship then completely reverses uh, if we have uh, under global warming. So we have a decreasing AMOC at lower latitudes, but an increasing high latitude heat transport. So this is part of the warming hole puzzle, I guess, Yeah, that we have these different behaviors and these different mechanisms that connect these ocean circulations if we force the climate with CO2. Okay, just on this last point of forcing the climate with CO2, I mean, we clearly are forcing the climate with CO2. We're adding tens of billions of tons every year. We're finding it very hard to stop doing that. So it doesn't look like the forcing's going away or there's a countervailing force at the moment. How committed do you think we are to a much slower AMOC and effectively a changed planet if we've got this heat transport going on between the Arctic region and the Atlantic? 
I would say that it's quite certain that the A book will show some form of slowing down. And I mean, it doesn't look like we are reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So, and even if we started to reduce them now, we would still likely see a warming of 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. So, and at that point, all of the different projections show that the AMO is going to weaken. And um, yeah, it depends, I guess, how much CO2 we emit also then affects how strong the warming hole will be and how strong the AMOC will decline. But I, I'm quite certain that it's going to decline at least in some form, yes. You're confirming the kind of undeniable trend in many respects, I think. Thank you for your interest. Thanks very much. It's been really insightful. 